welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to the Madden America podcast. And this week, our veterans editor, Derek Blumke, interviews co-founder of Remedy Alpine, David Joslin. But before I hand over to Derek, I wanted to say that this interview marks our 100th episode of the Madden America podcast, and we want to thank you for listening. We need your help to spread the word and to encourage more listeners. You can help us by subscribing to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and most other podcast providers. If you are a listener already and appreciate what we do, please leave us a review via your favorite podcast client and share the podcast on social media too. Thank you for your support and for listening. Welcome to Madden America, Military and Veteran Families podcast. This is Derek Blumke with Madden America. And today we have David Joslin. He is a former army medic who deployed to Iraq in 2003 and Afghanistan in 2008. Dave is currently working as a senior healthcare administrator and is a founder of Remedy Alpine a veterans therapeutic recreation nonprofit that provides therapeutic backcountry and wilderness therapy adventures in Alaska. David is also a contributor to Madden America and has published Broken Is Not All I'll Ever Be. David, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So you've got an incredible journey and an incredible series of stories, uh, and it's almost tough to figure out where to begin, but maybe if you could just talk to us and tell us kind of how your journey uh, brought you to starting Remedy Alpine uh, and got you into being so interested in helping veterans, uh, service members, and their families uh, with mental health. Sure. I appreciate it. So for my background in my story, which led to Remedy Alpine, I have to go back to uh, when the military did a damn good job of trying to kill me. I, uh, As people would find in my article, I went through a very typical scenario of being over-medicated to treat various symptoms with PTSD, traumatic brain injury, and just kind of the fog of war that we all come home with. Um, and as I uh, was weaning myself off very abruptly of medications uh, and just put my faith back in my family and, and trying to live a better life without uh, medications about every other hour, it seemed like. As a backcountry recreationalist and as a mountain climber for the military, as well, um, I started venturing out into the wilderness spaces and into the backcountry. And I just found that it, it was peaceful. Uh, I found that over time, I was able to relax in the backcountry. Uh, and then some other tangible benefits like my cell phone didn't ring out there uh, unless I wanted my wife and kids with me. Why my wife and kids were not with me. So that was kind of how I was able to ease out of my last couple, uh, my last year or so of active duty. Um, as I was finishing up my med board. And then as I got out of the military, um, I started having uh, a, a challenge with losing part of my identity as a combat medic. You know, the, the biggest reward that I had was taking care of the warfighter. And now that I was working in the private healthcare sector and no longer taking care of, you know, a, America's greatest asset, uh, I found a gap in my life. Um, I was still experiencing... Um, kind of healing in, in my own personal therapy in the backcountry. Uh, through the Wounded Warrior Project, I met who is now my business partner, Eric Collier. Uh, he was an EOD guy for the Air Force and another like-minded backcountry guy. And so as we started hiking and hanging out together uh, in the mountains up here, uh, just dialogue naturally kind of led to, we were both nurturing people that Hey, we should, you know, we enjoy being out in the country together or in a back country together. We enjoy uh, the kind of peace and solitude that comes with this. And we enjoy the camaraderie of being, you know, together with uh, each other as veterans. So one thing led to another in 2017. Uh, we were really kind of half heartedly joking about putting an event together. And over the course of two weeks in August of 17, we rapidly threw a, a, our first program together, um, and we it, we had eight people sign up for it. And, and when we actually stepped off the trailhead, only two were with us. Um, the, the other folks had dropped just by conflict, or they didn't like the fact that we didn't want to have guns or whatever in the wilderness because we were kind of very risk mitigation minded. Um, 
and so we we executed our first event on uh, uh, what is that Labor Day 2017. And when we got home from that event, we realized that you know from all the community support and the reputation that we had built in a very short amount of time, and people were hearing about what we were doing, there was a lot of interest in our program. When are you doing another event? How can I get on this event? And then so Eric and I kind of realized, hey, we have an actual thing here, right? And so we had to pump the brakes and then kind of backtrack the business process a little bit and file articles of incorporation and get a business license and establish ourselves as an actual company in the state of Alaska. And we did that. And then in winter of 18, we opened up again with some winter camping events. And uh, yeah, we've been going for two years strong now. We've got a third partner. Uh, Last year, we took 49 veterans into the wilderness, and then we connected with 150 veterans at some of our outreach and enrichment events that we do in the local community in Alaska. That's great. I mean, it sounds like a lot of amazing success quickly. What would you say was kind of the, the pivotal factor that brought so many veterans out to do this type of thing? Because it sounds like this is kind of a, a very unique approach to wellness and mental health that is not commonly seen within, say, the DOD or VA mental health systems? Yeah, I, I, no, great question. I, I think a, a large part of it is we're all kind of tired of being fed pills, right? I mean, and that only, that only propagates isolationism. And what I think a lot of the service members that we take care of are looking for is that camaraderie piece. And you can't have a pill party. You know, that doesn't bond camaraderie, you know, but as service members, we embrace the suck a little bit. We like the challenge. We're used to being out in, in the wilderness or, you know, in nature, because uh, that's where we go to the field to train and, and prepare for our deployments and what we did for our country. And so I think that there was enough of the the kind of the paramilitary feel to it uh, without the threat. Um, I th- I'd like to think that me and Eric and our personalities kind of add to it. There is some very defined therapeutic content to what we do. Um, so I think it just filled the void for a lot of the folks and what they were looking for. And then also, I think some of it too, if you look at the Alaska population, most of the service members that re- retire in Alaska, they do so for a reason. They like, they like the mountains. They, they like extended, very long winters, which we have. Uh, and I'm sure you're not uh, you know, unfamiliar with those in, in Michigan either. But you know, it, the, the, the locale kind of attracts a certain lifestyle person. So we were kind of in a target-rich environment for us. We're right outside of Anchorage which is uh, where Joint Base Elmendorf Richardson's at. So you've got an Air Force base and an Army base and uh, you know, a paratrooper brigade, a PJ team up here. So we've got a good complement and, and diverse, multi-dynamic military society up here. And, and so I think the programs just kind of spoke directly to the community that we, that we now serve. And so could you go back a little bit? So you talk about a lot of the, uh, that you can't have a pill party. And you talked about the government trying to kill you. <laughs> could, could you go into that a little bit more? Because it's, you've got a very common story. And it's, uh, it, of course, it's not the same for every person. But you and I share a similar story in that we were prescribed multiple drugs, multiple drugs at the same time, weren't necessarily aware of yep. the risk of those drugs. Um, could you tell a little more about your story? And kind of, um, there's a lot of listeners that really can empathize and appreciate yeah. uh, what you went through. And I, I think it'd be really helpful for a lot of folks who maybe haven't figured out what's going on for themselves yet, but by sure. hearing your story, it might help them figure out, Hey, maybe this is what's going on. Sure. Um, so my last deployment uh, was in Afghanistan in 2008 and 2009. And then when I got home from deployment, I was out of Fort hood, Texas within 38 days, I landed from Afghanistan reintegrated, out-processed, PCS'd, and moved to Alaska and signed into my new brigade in Alaska in 38 days. And so I didn't really even start decompressing or mentally redeploying until I was at a new duty station because it was such a fast pace uh, and such a, a, a rapid tempo to move my family before the new school year started. And so when we got to my new installation, uh, you know, as a medic, one of the opportunities I had was to work in a hospital, and I, I did go to college and study healthcare administration. So I was assigned to the hospital at Fort Wainwright, um, which was good and bad, right? I mean, there's it, it's good because I'm surrounded by healthcare providers that I work with every day that 
uh, are uh, you know attentive to the the things that they're seeing and out of my demonstrated behavior. But it's bad because the people I work with are in my business every day. You know, so I started having some some real challenges with uh, post traumatic issues just from the number of attacks and firefights. Uh, and you know, as a medic, I got to see the worst of humanity. Uh, I had multiple friends die in my arms. Uh, I did, you know, local national healthcare and humanitarian missions and nothing that's, you know, out of the ordinary for the typical combat medic who's actually done a real deployment. But, you know, this is, you know, after a couple of deployments, it had residual effects on me. And, you know, so I was starting to have some, uh, some physical, behavioral and emotional um, problems with it, you know. Um, So as I was seeking help for it, you know, the kind of the, the early on uh, treatment was like, hey, we're going to let you talk to somebody and then here, take this medicine. And then, oh, you can't sleep. So here, take this medicine. Oh, you're having nightmares. So here, take this pill before you go to bed and this one to help you stay asleep. Oh, and now you've got blood pressure problems. So here's this blood pressure pill. And oh, now you can't focus and maintain concentration. So here's, here's some medication for you to take for your, uh, for your focus and concentration. So at the height of what I call my better living through chemistry, I was on, I think it was about 13 different medications. And I, I honestly felt I was just living one drug to the next. And although they were trying different, you know, counseling therapies and, and you know, prolonged exposure and, and different types of therapies with me, the, the fallback was always, here's another pill to take. You know, as a medic, I am trained to a certain degree in pharmacology. And so as I started realizing, you know, hey, the, one of the top 10 side effects of every drug you just gave me is increased suicidal homicidal ideation or increased thoughts of suicide. Like none of this makes sense. So I did, and I talk about it in my article that you mentioned uh, that was published over the summer with Mad America, you know, probably the dumbest thing that somebody could do, but I did it anyway. You know, I just took myself off all of my medications which is a very dangerous thing to do. And for those listening, do not, I, I, I stress, do not do that without consultation, guidance, and, and supervision from a clinician. So what point did you realize, hey, something is wrong? Like, and, and you realized maybe it was a meds that was causing your ails. The point that I realized something was wrong is I was planning my own suicide. Um, I'd accepted that I didn't want to live the way I was living. I, I was accepting that I didn't want to have the challenges that I had. I began to believe that I was no longer fit to be a husband or a father. I couldn't see myself as being a role model for my children. I, I, I was an insomniac zombie that I, I didn't sleep, but I was up all the time, but I was always tired. And I, I literally lived one drug to the next and I found that not fitting. And so I, at one point I it accepted that I was going to kill myself and it just went to where I was planning it. And then as I was planning it, um, I picked that I was going to shoot myself with my pistol uh, because that was quick and I didn't want to suffer and I didn't want to feel pain. And as I'm talking through this, I'm like, wait a minute, hold on, pump the brakes here. You don't want to feel pain. You don't want to die. If you don't want this to be uh-huh. miserable and you don't want to suffer, then maybe you still want to live. And I started rethinking things. And that's what I, I, I kind of got to that breaking point that, wait a minute, I'm always the glass half full kind of guy. I'm always the motivator. I'm always the guy who tries to see the best of everybody. And now I'm planning my own death. Um, and there's got to be a problem here. And uh, just with a, the, you know, the, the kind of basic background in pharmacology that combat medics get, I led that, uh, the, to the assumption that the problem was all the medications that I was on. And for me, it was had to be kind of cold turkey. And I, uh, I took myself off of them immediately. And so I, I, just to point this out for everybody listening that maybe is not familiar with the military and veteran community, uh, medics in the, the the army, navy, and other branches, uh, they're called DOC. Uh, all, all their fellow soldiers, all the troops call them DOC. When something happens, they yell at DOC. Uh, and so it's really just interesting that you are kind of the expert within your group, and you kind of fell victim to this as well. Did that ever strike you as like, how did this happen? It did to a certain degree, and then... It wasn't until after I, my own near-death experience and my own road to recovery, which is a continual path, that I started getting into the factors behind suicide. And I realized that, you know, from my platoon in Afghanistan, I, I'd assisted in no less than three suicide interventions. 
And I started trying to think about why are all my guys wanting wow. to kill themselves? And since the article, um, I started putting a lot more thought into that as well. You know, why are why are my guys wanting to to kill themselves? And as we talk offline, because we we still keep in touch, you know, to your point earlier, it's a similar story. And as I talk to my guys and still try to be the platoon sergeant and the role model for them, you know, as I'm talking to them, hey, what are you going through? They're just like, man, it's just another medication. Or I'll flat out ask some of them, how many how many meds do they have you on? And well, I got this for this, and then I got this for this, and then they put me on this for this. And and these are guys that were, you know, the the cream of the crop at the, being a frontline care provider for the, the best class of warrior in the military uh, that did remarkable things. Uh, but unfortunately, our job put us at that point on the battlefield where we were seeing people at their worst, and we had to take that and carry it with us. And then we had to get up and do it again the next day. And it has a gradual toll on everybody, but you know, and I and I, I get and understand that everyone responds and, and decompresses and copes differently. But what I did find common with my soldiers and my friends that I've spoken with that were all going through these same similar circumstances is, uh, in, in my personal opinion, uh, professional or not, you know, they're very heavily medicated, multiple, medic- multiple medications to treat different behavioral or emotional problems. Uh, and they're all falling in line in one of the same two or three classifications of drugs. So let's go back to, okay, so you're like, this is a problem. Uh, I don't want to die. I don't want to have pain. This is not the right course. So we're back to cold turkey. Yeah, so back to cold turkey. Um, My wife woke up one day and I was literally flushing my pills down the toilet, creating problems for fish and game, I'm sure. She's like, what the the hell are you doing? And I said, "I, I just, I can't do this anymore. You know, so I, I told her I was putting my faith in her and God and that, that that's the only thing that I could put my faith in. Uh, I had some really good friends that I was, you know, active with socially in it wasn't until my article came out. I was, you know, we're really good at hiding the worst parts of our life. Um, my wife, uh, my family, my best friends, nobody knew that I was actively planning my suicide. But, you know, as I was coming off my medications. Uh, you know, I, I did confide in my friend, my closest friend and let him know, Hey, I'm just not doing that anymore. And he kind of gave me this perplexed look like what you can't do that. You know, so I was really, I was reaching out for social, social structures and increased social structures, getting involved in, in church, getting involved in community activities and hanging out with my friends more and hanging out on the mountain more, getting out into the wilderness, um, and just seeking that kind of comfort and being away from society, but not alone being away from society with people that I trusted in an environment that was calming and peaceful to me. Well, that sounds a hell of a lot better than being on 13 drugs. It, it is. <laughs> I'm still alive. And to this day, I can say it's a lot better than being on 13 drugs. Not that I'm not without <laughs> residual problems. I still, I still have nightmares. I still have social anxiety problems. I still am hypervigilant. You know, I still analyze every window, every exit, and every person. Uh, in a room when I walk into a room, but my coping mechanisms and the way I deal with that is a lot better than just being numb to the world around me and not caring enough to count the doors, count the windows, and know who's in the room with me. <laughs> you know, uh, mm-hmm. I, I feel I feel like I'm I'm contributing. You know, I feel like um, since then I've been a role model for my children. I've been able to be active and involved with them. I think I've been a a better husband, a better father and a better community leader, just because I've been in more control of myself. You know, and I think my personality's probably gotten back to being the witty me versus just the, the dumbed down version of me. So. So you were talking about your cold turkey when you first stopped. And, and this is what I kind of wanted to dig into because a lot of listeners, they uh, who've gone through this themselves, they understand. But for many who aren't, uh, familiar, haven't gone through this themselves. It's difficult to translate uh, the level of risk profile that is created when somebody is coming off of psychiatric drugs. Uh, for me, it was antidepressants, but for many others, it's all kinds of meds. Um, and so for you, do you have any specific stories or anything that you think was most concerning as you were withdrawing yourself from the cocktail of drugs? Yeah. So, uh, one of the things looking back that I realized, uh, actually how dangerous the situation I had created, 
of course, in the moment, you don't always realize everything. Um, my fits of rage and anger uh, were at a level that I don't think anybody had ever seen them before. Never to the point where it got physical with anything or anybody, but very violent outbursts. Initially, there were increased thoughts of suicide. I knew what I was putting myself through, but you know, I kept going back that you don't have to go through this. You don't have to go through this. And I don't know you know, what it was, but I, I kept thinking about it more and more, almost to the point where I was uh, almost fixated on it. And then all of the, all of the other symptoms and problems that I had uh, were exacerbated. If I did sleep, they were just nightmare uh, filled dreams. Um, I was you know, always on guard worse than ever. I could never relax. Um, and just, uh, yeah, a complete, you know, amped up charge of every side effect that I had dealt with. But the, the worst and the most problematic that, that I think uh, in hindsight put my family uh, at risk and, and not just my family, but myself, but I think of my family first is just the increased rage uh, to, a, to a level and a degree that uh, no child or, or wife should ever have to see. Did this play at all, uh, I guess, run over into your military career? Because it sounds like up until this point, you'd had a pretty successful military career. Um, I had. And um, what, what had led to my med board was actually um, what, I, what I described in the article. I was in a combat simulation training center for uh, medical skills. It was uh, a market IED car bomb uh, scenario. And I've actually worked many of those. Um, so it was very... <laughs> It, it was very real. In the course of about 10 seconds from the start of the scenario, when I started doing triage on all these $80,000 dummies that they had to make it as real as possible, I kind of zoned into a flashback. And it was so vivid and so real. It was caught on the, the closed circuit cameras as they were monitoring everything in this uh, high-tech lab. It was all witnessed. Uh, and when I came out of the simulation trainer, I was visibly shaking, even though we were in Alaska and it was uh, not hot outside. I couldn't stop sweating. I, I was just, I was not mentally in a good spot. And you know, they, they actually had to call my wife and have my wife come pick me up. This happened while I was um, in probably about halfway through the height of medication. Um, I had already been seeking assistance uh, in counseling. So I was, I was on the, the, the medication cocktail. I wasn't like going straight from the keg with it like I was at the, the height of my problems. It took probably about six months for them to start amping up. Once I had kind of that, that breakdown in the, the simulation lab, uh, then it was like, oh, we've got we've to charge up this dose here to control this, and we've got to take care of this. And then it was really starting to, to amp up the number of medications that they, that they were prescribing me. One of the, like, what I find most concerning is that they were prescribing you these drugs while serving in the United States military. And like, oh, yeah. you are being put in scenarios where life and death situations occur regularly. We'll look back probably at this time. It's probably the most dangerous class of drugs ever created. And here you go. And we're going to put you out on the field and put you into combat. Yeah, absolutely. The risks to myself, the, you know, the, somebody in that state, you know, it's easy for me to say I wasn't a risk. I was okay, right? Because we lived through it. And I, other than a couple of public outbursts and the things that me and my family went through, most people it's going to be a non-event for, right? But the potential is there for it to have been a lot worse. You know, if my background, if the the amount of residual trauma from my background had been different, or there had been one socioeconomic factor that was different about my life versus somebody else who had the same experience as me, or just their personal composition was just a little bit different than mine. It could have led to a completely different outcome uh, by, by every stretch of the imagination. Uh, and I think we've seen some of that play out, quite honestly. I don't think they talk about it. I don't think the details behind it are released. Uh, I, I, think, I don't think anybody really wants that information to be out there, but the sad reality is, and for us to fully understand the damage, the potential damage, the risk, and the potential risk, we have to talk about these things. We have to make we have to make it scientifically proven that yes, this does cause this, 
in some of the bad scenarios that we've seen play out across the world quite possibly could have been related to some of these medications that they put us on. Well, I want to thank you for telling us all of that because it's not easy digging back into these stories um, from personal experience. I know it's not a lot of fun trudging through a lot of this old trauma. Um, it's something that you wish had never happened, but the reality is it did and that you're comfortable and brave enough and also recognizing that you are in a position to help others through telling of your story is really just truly impressive. So first off, thank you for sharing that story and sharing all of this with us. Um, but I'd like to go to now uh, where you're at with Remedy Alpine, what your goals are, and how you see this as being a new option or a new direction for mental health, for service members, uh, veterans, their families, and others. I'd love to just kind of hear you talk about where you've been from, where we just discussed, and then where you'd like to see this go. Sure. I'll, I'll try to pick up where we kind of left off with, uh, you know, once we got incorporated and picked our business back up in the, the winter, spring of 18. Uh, in line with the business process side of it, we we became a nonprofit. We filed our application with, you know, or awarded our, our 501c3 status uh, actually just this week. So we got our cage code assigned to us and we're listed as a government contractor. Specifically, and we went after that specifically so we can start going after um, some grants offered by the government for recreational based programs. And then also so, you know, the VA could pay us should the Alaska VA that we do partner with from time to time choose to actually hire us as um, a therapeutic modality to assist veterans in Alaska on a larger scale. So that's kind of the business side of it, the the fun side of it, uh, what I like to do being out in the mountain. Um, like I said, we helped 49 veterans last year. So we run three different core programs. We do single day hikes. We do single overnight camping events. And we do multi-day, multi-night through hikes. Those could range up to 26 to 30 miles uh, through the mountains in Alaska. We operate year round. Uh, so it's not just good weather adventure, right? Uh, kind of back to what I was saying earlier in the military, we embrace the sucks. So uh, actually coming up the 23rd and 24th of February, we're doing an overnight winter camping skills event where we'll hike out four miles from the nature center in Eagle River, which is just north of Anchorage. Uh, and we'll, we'll set up uh, a winter camp and establish a camp and teach some winter camping skills and some survival skills and spend the night. And then the next day we'll hike out. And as long as the river is still closed up and frozen, we'll go over some frozen water navigation skills and and teach people how to navigate frozen water. So yeah, we, we, those are our core programs. Understanding that trust is an issue for some veterans with the, the, some of the challenges that a lot of us have. We offer a program twice a month called Bullets to Beans. It's a coffee program uh, where we get together at the local, one of the local coffee shops and just hang out and chat. Uh, sometimes you know we try to talk about our programs to get people interested and involved in them. Sometimes we talk sports. Uh, sometimes we talk about transition and coping with life after the military, which has led to one of the newest things that we just launched uh, two weeks ago, which was our own podcast under the same title, Bullets to Beans, where every week we get on and we, we're talking about different military life and post-military life challenges. Uh, we've got uh, a, a good lineup of shows that we're in the process of putting together. And then one of the things that I, I think is really important to talk about, Remedy Alpine sent a team to the University of Utah in Salt Lake City in November to a conference called the Nature's Grace Conference. And what this was is a five-year post-mortem symposium from a conference that happened five years earlier, where kind of the pioneer organizations and agencies that were working with veterans using natural spaces and backcountry and wilderness as a therapeutic modality or, or an adjunctive therapy for post-traumatic stress, anxiety, depression, and other, um, other disorders uh, that are common with the folks in the military. So we went as kind of the freshman class, the, the new folks. Uh, and what we found literally the day that we walked in there is we had already had a national following. 
hey, that was a, a total surprise to us. We thought we were three guys up in Alaska <laughs> hiking the mountains, doing things, you know, and people from organizations in Florida and New York and other places are like, hey, we're glad you guys sent a team. We're like, how do you even know us? So that made us, that, that's kind of what the evolution of the podcast was. We, we walked out of there understanding better how to deliver programs of quality to veterans. We walked out of there with a larger network of support of how to, you know, engage our programs that don't create more trauma to veterans. And then we walked out of there understanding that now that we realize we have a, a very small national following, but nonetheless a national following, we have an obligation and a responsibility to conduct ourselves as such. So we were looking at ways how we could reach, because right now we, we're a very small budget uh, organization. So we don't have a, a travel budget. We can't pay to fly veterans up to Alaska to experience the mountains up here yet. We're hoping to get to that. Uh, I brought a grant writer on board specifically to help us with that. But in the meantime, how can we reach out and, and reach veterans in other states and outside of just the state of Alaska because we're kind of a land island up here? Uh, and you know that new tool, the internet that everyone talks about, we figured that was a good tool to use to, to get our name and our brand out there. Um, you know, we're on most of the social media platforms. The other week we posted, uh, we got new stickers and new kind of swag and we posted, hey, you know, drop us a, a message if you want some of our new stickers. And I didn't mail a single pack of stickers out to Alaska. They went to Virginia, they huh. went to Texas, they went to Washington, they went to Arizona, they went to Kentucky, they went to Kansas. Uh, they went all over the United States and I didn't put one envelope in the mail for Alaska. That's great. Do you have any stories from some of the folks who've gone through your program that you like maybe maybe one that you'd like to highlight? Yeah, thanks. I, I appreciate the opportunity. We actually just started another program that we're just now launching. We've got our first cohort of veteran peer peer mentors. And so the the very first person that we selected in this cohort, her name is Lizzie. Uh, she's an Air Force veteran. She joined us last year on one of our three-day, 26-mile hikes. And then she had such a good time at it and enjoyed the camaraderie and what she got out of it. She came back for the next three-day, 26-mile hike. Uh, and then she kept reaching out and trying to keep in touch. And then she did our first winter skills camp with us over the winter uh, it, in the beginning of December this year. Uh, and her feedback she gave us her, she was one of the first people that gave us a review on our facebook page and just her constant contact with us and the remedy alpine team as we were already in the process of building this uh program of using veterans as peer mentors and peer guides on the mountain you know we reached out to her and asked if she would be interested in applying or being part of our first cohort and kind of our, our test bed of putting this program together and she was ecstatic um and to see her go to, uh, you know, from the time I met her until the time she came off the trail with us, the first time you could see an elevation of, you know, her spirit and she felt more alive and her attitude. And then after the second trip she did with us again, she kept growing and kept, you know, coming out of her cell a little bit more. When we, when we asked her to be a part of our team and that she realized that she was now going to not only get to sign up for or apply to go on these trips with us. She would be one of the team members on the mountain, on the trip with us, helping other veterans. When we were doing her onboarding last week and she was, uh, she was like a little kid sitting on Santa's lap. She was just, uh, she was bubbly. She was excited. She brought ideas to the table and we were kind of like, oh, slow down. We got, you know, we got a process here, but I love your energy. And it's totally, we want to focus on this first cohort. There's one other uh, EOD technician that we selected as a very small cohort cohort for the first round of this. And we're going to run this cycle for the next six months and start doing some feedback. And we've got some very programmatic assessments along the way to make sure that they're growing uh, and that we can get feedback from them. We're hoping that this is something that we launch either once a year or twice a year that we will add a cohort and ask veterans to help expand our team. So you know, if we have more trusted peer mentors to be out on the mountain, I can take more soldiers or veterans out on the mountain as well. So that's, I, bet, I think, our best good news story. Um, our best funny story, people, uh, the, some of the other interviews I've done, people want to hear a funny story <laughs> from the mountain. 
June, the very first trip that Lizzie was on with us um, in June of last year, a 26 mile trip through Crow Pass in Alaska, we got chased down a trail by a moose for uh, the better part of a quarter of a mile. It was just, we had just come out of the Alpine into the tree line. Uh, and it was just a narrow single width trail with high brush and trees on both sides. And as we're walking down the trail and we've got two guides and nine veterans with us. So there's a party of 11. We come upon this huge bull moose uh, and Bullwinkle turned around and stared at us. And we're like, okay, start backing up, you know, get big, get loud, try to scare him off, but start giving him, you know, a wide berth and give him some room. And he got curious about this large group of people. So he started following us. So we started moving faster. So he started moving faster. So we started running and he started chasing. So it took about a quarter mile till we could find a clearing <laughs> and get off the trail. And then he had this, he stopped and he had this look on his face. Like I could go stomp these humans and no one would know, or I could leave them alone. And luckily he left us alone. But so yeah, we got chased about a quarter of a mile and added another hour plus onto our day getting chased by Bullwinkle. <laughs> Right. Well, David, this is this is so much fun. Thanks a lot for uh, sharing all your stories, uh, for doing everything that you're doing for vets and their families. This is the this is the type of thing that we get excited about here. The the new directions that we can take with what we currently call mental health. It, it's looking to be more of an exciting future. The more more I talk to people like you that are doing these great things, so. Um, is there any, like, how do people find find you if they want to get involved, they want to support you, or they want to uh, do one of your uh, adventures, hopefully not being chased by Bullwinkle? <laughs> sure. No, I appreciate that. So we can be found online at uh, remedyalpine.org. Uh, we're on Facebook at Remedy Alpine. We're on Instagram uh, at Remedy underscore Alpine. Um, our podcast bullets to beans is at bullets to beans on Facebook. And we have, uh, a tab page on the, the main web page for bullets to beans. And we're on, we're on Stitcher. We're on Spotify. We're on Apple, of course, we're on Google. So we're on the major podcast outlets. Uh, we just, uh, put up another episode last night, uh, and we release weekly. So, but yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about that. All right. Well, uh, David, thanks again. Uh, really look forward to seeing you in the future and seeing all this amazing work. And I guess until next time, uh, this is Madden America, Military and Veterans Families. And we really look forward to talking with you, working with you, and looking towards a better future. Thank That's you. It. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.